we're hiking back into your favorite place, the woods. Today's story have no common theme except that they are set in the wilderness. These are a random assortment of forest horror stories that will chill you or perhaps excite you into discovering what truly works within the trees. If you're like me, you're probably curious, but as the saying goes, curiosity ended that cat's whole career, or something like that. If you have a scary story that you'd like to have narrated, share it with us at darkstories.org. Don't think you're alone in the woods at 3 a.m. From Terrifier 1010. My friend Kenny and I have a tradition. You see, every summer he and I treat ourselves by taking a camping trip up in the mountains. Now when I say camping, I don't mean camping at a campground with bathrooms and showers that you have to reserve months in advance to get a spot for, where families set up their fancy RVs. No, I mean actually camping. Kenny and I, we go way back. We grew up in the backwoods of our beautiful Southland, where we spent our childhoods romping around in creeks, climbing trees, staying out past dark, and nobody batted an eye. So when we needed a break from life, we go where our hearts take us. Our prime spot would be deep into the wilderness of the rugged yet pristine Mark Twain National Park. Up so high, you wouldn't dream of getting cell phone reception and you wouldn't dream of even wanting it. Nobody dares trek as far as we do. Kenny is actually a search and rescue officer working for the state of Missouri, and I'm a rancher. You can see why we look forward to and take our annual getaway so seriously. This getaway though, just about ruined it for us. I'm about to tell you the story of why Kenny and I dare not go back to Mark Twain National Park. Our weekend started off fine, except for a late start. We spent the night before celebrating our upcoming trip, and well, things got out of hand. We partied a little too hard, had a late start the next day, as we tried to sleep off some hangovers. We made it to the parking lot about two hours before sundown, just enough time to set up camp upon nightfall. We loaded up our gear, locked the truck, and went on our way. About an hour and a half into the hike, we were coming up on our usual spot to set up camp for the week. It's on this cliffside with the clearing we dug out years ago. The view over the forest we have from up there can't be beat, and there's a plentiful creek nearby to get all our fishing and bathing done in. It's perfect for us, or at least it was, until that year. We were almost there, when all of a sudden we stopped and locked eyes. The woods had gone quiet, and we knew something was wrong. Aside from the wind rustling in the leaves, we couldn't hear a dang thing, and when that happens, it means there's something nearby that the animals are afraid of. Kenny and I knew that we should be cautious too. We weren't interested in wasting time though, so instead of continuing on towards camp and setting up our tents, we dropped our packs at our feet and fixed up our rifles, prepared for whatever may come our way. We stayed there for hours, waiting for the sounds to return, but they didn't. It was soon 3 a.m. It was absolute darkness. A smell came over us. The closest I could describe this odor would be what comes out of an overflowing outhouse that's been rotting all summer. But it wasn't a skunk, or anything we've gotten used to in our years camping here. This wasn't normal. Moments later, the ground began to shake. There was a noise, but it could have been the sound of our blood rushing in our ears. We could feel our cores trembling with the vibrations of the earth rising through our feet. Something was coming down on us that our ears weren't tuned in to hear, but we could feel it a beating drum in our chests, like thump, the thump, the thump. But there was something we could hear, and that was the sound of trees breaking. That was a deafening sound, the crack of a trunk that's been growing for centuries suddenly snapping. 
we readied our rifles toward the west from where the sound had come. We braced ourselves. When it came into view, it's hard to describe what we saw in its full glory. It was unlike anything I've witnessed before, an entity of some kind. A shining light shone from above us about eight feet, sickly yellow lights that I knew were eyes. A feral intelligence poured out of those eyes, eating away at us before it ever touched us. I panicked and twitched, firing a shot toward the thing. Kenny soon followed after. We paused to assess what damage we may have done, but whatever we fired at did not seem phased at all. Now considering my Remington Magnum 30-06 had dropped bears before that are now decorating my living room, I was stunned. To say that mine and Kenny's weapons had made no difference in that moment, it horrified us. The two of us took off, in a second, we were both booking it back down the trail toward the truck, our packs left abandoned where they lay. I wish I could go back and see what became of our packs. Maybe there'd be a clue as to what that thing was. But I don't dare go back, and I hope those reading this story aren't tempted to either. Kenny and I made it back to the truck, a feat neither of us thought we were capable of, not that quickly. We agreed not to tell anyone what happened, because we did not want to be responsible for anyone else risking their lives up there, someone who may be curious or act on to go see that creature. Besides that, we were sure that no one else would believe us. What we do know is that people aren't welcome there. Werebear of Estes Park from Griffin I'm not the type of person to write these kinds of things or to warn others to stay away from places, but I feel like I've got to get this off my chest. People need to know about my experience. Heaven knows I was lucky to make it out alive. I'm a bagpiper who plays in a competitive band from Kansas City. In the early fall of 2016, the band would take a trip to Estes Park, Colorado for Highland games that they have up there. Being a native from Kansas and a young man of 17, I was used to the flat plains of the Midwest where the weather was mildly consistent. But this was all very different when I traveled to Colorado, where tall mountains and vast forests were the norm. I'll never forget the first glimpse of the mountains as we approached. You could clearly see the outlines of the huge rocks in the sky, which was quite a bewildering sight. Upon arriving at the mountains, I took great care to notice the huge trees and rocks with rivers that flowed down them. I was thinking this was the closest I'd get to prehistoric America. I drove up with my two bandmates, Ethan and Jim. They were both pipers themselves and happened to be father and son. Ethan was my age and Jim, of course, was much older, but we managed to have the best time riding in that car with no air conditioning jamming out to bagpipe music. To this day, we have remained best friends. The plan was to arrive on Friday where we would stay at the YMCA. On Saturday, we would play the morning parade and our first contest. On Sunday, we would play our second contest and leave on Monday. Highland games are usually spread over the course of a weekend where a band would play two contests as well as masked bands both days. The first two days were spent getting our instruments set to the climate and altitude. As we would all learn, our pipes did not do well at higher altitudes, being from Kansas. I was responsible for a lot of the tuning that went on in the pipe core, so unfortunately I was subject to a lot of stress, trying to get two bands each playing two contests, as well as massed bands all set to play. I was also having a massive headache that only copious amounts of water could cure. I also attributed this to the altitude. After our first contest on Saturday, we all returned to the hotel, tired, hungry, and dehydrated. All the guys got together in the hotel lobby for some drinks and laughs to settle the mood. I, however, tried to escape my headache by going on a peaceful walk around the YMCA. Ethan asked if he could join me and I said yes. He and I talked about the day as well as some funny things to make us laugh 
We made our way slowly around the parking lots and recreational trails. The sun had long since set, and we could begin to hear the cries of deer and possibly elk in the forest. If you've ever been to a national park, you'll know that the tree line in the parking lot is separated only by a few feet of badly mown grass. And this is where Ethan and I had begun to gravitate towards as our lodge was in this general direction. The night air felt cool and relieved me of my sunburn and headache for a while, but then it became chilly and soon we were both shivering. Ethan and I were in the middle of a conversation, probably talking about girls or something. As we approached the lodge, we could hear the laughter and joyous giggles of our pals, but I also heard something else among them. A distant howl, much like a wolf's, but deeper and mixed with something more guttural, more reptilian. I heard it echo from a hill in the distance. As I turned in its direction, a flock of birds scattered away from the trees where the sound had come from. As soon as I heard the sound, I shushed Ethan in the middle of his sentence. What? He asked. Did you not hear that? I answered. A apparently not. What was it? We stood in silence for a moment to see if it might happen again, but we were met with only the wind whipping through the tree branches. It's probably nothing, I said. Maybe just a deer or something. I tried to brush it off and take my mind off of it. We resumed our conversation as we entered the lodge. We were greeted by our bandmates. Most of them inebriated or slightly tipsy, set us down and made us join in on games and stories. As the night dragged on and the crowd of drunken pipers and drummers became slimmer, I still couldn't forget about that sound. I had decided that I needed to go out again and see what I could find out about it. I told Ethan and Jim that I forgot my phone charger in the car and that I needed to go get it. I walked slowly out the door, but as soon as I was out of sight, I ran to the hill where the sound had come from. My feet were aching from standing all day, but I pushed on so I could hurry back to the hotel. I approached the tree line, then began to slow my pace, catching my breath and slowing my heart down so I could concentrate. The thought that the creature I was looking for could be dangerous hadn't really crossed my mind, yet I found myself to be even more cautious as I was investigating this. I moved closer to the tree line, trying to peer inside the wall of sticks and branches. Through a small opening close to the ground, I managed to duck down and crawl into the woods. The sound of the air disappeared, and I was left with only the solemn silence of the woods paired with my footsteps, crunching the twigs and leaves. It was much darker in the woods as the trees blocked out the moon. I peered around in the darkness, scanning for movement and listening for the quietest sound. It felt like hours that I waited in those woods, taking in the smells and the sounds and the sights. The stillness of the forest was suddenly disrupted by a sharp huff that sounded only a few yards away. I was paralyzed then. It was the kind of fear you get when you're alone and someone jumps out at you. Only this was more terrifying as I could not see who occupied the forest with me. I could hear something tossing about the dead foliage on the ground, twigs snapping, leaves shuffling, and a mysterious rattling like that of thick wooden wind chimes. My fear heightened when I heard the branches from the trees above creak and snap as something huge stood up where its head was illuminated in the scarce moonlight. I could see black fuzzy patches of hair atop its huge head. Frozen, I watched in horror as the creature began to move forward, stepping into the light and revealing its massive features. Its snout was proportionately short and stubby and was covered in dead skin and scratches. Its head was large and round, roughly the size of an armchair. On its hind legs, it stood to about 12 feet. Its arms dragged the ground and were as thick as my whole body, bearing claws as long as my hand. On the bare furless spots on its body were markings, not like wounds, but more like tattoos. They made very distinct shapes and formed symbols resembling what I can only describe as Aztec markings. 
I'm certain that's not what it was, but that's what they looked like. As the creature lowered its head, I could also make out a loose rope hanging from its neck that had bones, feathers, and stones tied to it. When the necklace moved, it created the low rattling sound I had heard before. The creature continued to inch toward me. Its massive head and snout came down to my level, and I could feel the hot breath of the bear. The smells that came from this creature's mouth were absolutely horrid. Imagine if some old hillbilly had chewed a cigar mixed with spoiled meat and washed it down with vinegar, then brushed his teeth with gasoline. That might come close to the fumes this thing emitted. I blinked quickly as its breath made my eyes water. It was only until two huge glowing eyes opened in its head that I realized that this was no ordinary bear. I've never seen a real bear in the wild. I had no concept of the size it should be, but I surely knew what one looked like. But this thing's eyes were totally and completely human. They were massive blue eyes. It quickly raised its head higher than mine, but remained focused on me. It began growling that deep rumble that had come from those trees hours ago. When it began to raise its claws, my body finally reacted. In two quick steps, I took my eyes off of the bare thing and aimed for the small hole in the trees that I had come from. I ducked to crawl through, but as I hit the ground, I felt the bear's arm swipe, causing my legs to fall out from underneath me. My entire body somersaulted in air and landed on my side, knocking all the wind out of me. My side burned as my lungs screamed for oxygen and my muscles throbbed. I seized the following moment to crawl through the tree line. I suddenly realized that what was a tough barrier for me to exit the forest was only a curtain to that massive thing. I turned my head to see the bear's massive head forced through the foliage, accompanied with that same deafening roar. I didn't care what the bear did. All I was thinking was that I needed to get as far away from it as possible. I ran to the building. The lobby was empty when I arrived. Everyone had gone upstairs to bed and their plastic cups remained in their seats. I ran to the glass window to peer at the same group of trees, only to find that the creature had returned to its forest castle. Shaking, I walked up the stairs to our room and reached for the room key. Only the key was no longer in my back pocket. I realized that it must have fallen out in the forest during the escape. I grew ever more afraid since the key had the lodge and room number written on it. I knocked on the door to be greeted by Jim. He and Ethan were getting dressed for bed. They asked where I had gone off to as I had been gone for about 15 minutes. I said that I couldn't find the charger and that's why it took so long. I figured if I started spouting some nonsense about a monstrous bear that they wouldn't take me seriously. We climbed into our beds. I was soon greeted by the loud snoring of my roommates. I didn't sleep at all that night. I was terrified of the dark that entire night and kept looking outside for any motion in the trees. Even though the window was facing the opposite direction of the trees, it gave me comfort to know that I had a watch in the lodge that night. The sun started to rise at about 6 a.m., where I finally was able to shut my eyes to get a few hours in before we had to get up. At 9 a.m., Jim woke me up to begin getting ready. I was so exhausted that he had to wake me several times before I finally got up. As we donned our kilts and uniforms for the day, we heard a knock on the door. Ethan opened it to reveal a short, tan man in a white tank top standing in our doorway. He had jet black hair that was long and pulled back. He looked Native American by his stature. Morning, he exclaimed. He drew a small white object from behind his back. Found this room key in the parking lot while I was doing my rounds. Just thought y'all should be wanting it back. I stood in absolute terror as I began to recognize some of the man's features. The patches on his skin that looked like eczema and the tribal tattoos. The same things I had seen the night before on that bear. He was even wearing the same necklace. Ah, this must be Griffin's key, Ethan said. 
He probably lost it near his car yesterday night, the man said, peering back at me. Ethan turned around and placed the card in my hands. The man reached forward and grabbed my hand to shake it. I'm one of the caretakers here at the lodge. You can rest easy that you're safe up here and we'll always watch your back. Those words continue to haunt me to this very day. He shook my hand with a powerful, almost threatening grip, his eyes never breaking eye contact with me, letting me know that he was in control. This tiny man who was fairly skinny and looked old enough to be my grandfather had completely dominated me. For the rest of the weekend, he would know where I stayed, and he knew my name. I often think about what happened to me that fall in Colorado. I was stupid to go into those woods alone, first of all. I think about the bear and the man that visited us in our room, and I wonder if he's still alive. If he is, does he still remember my name? All I can honestly say is, if you're going to stay at the YMCA in Colorado, please don't go into the woods at night and especially not by yourself. Awakened at 3 a.m. from Nervous Vein. This occurred on the Kitsap Peninsula in Washington State. My family owns a cabin in one of the more remote towns in the peninsula. It sits around three acres of a combination of forest, field, and beach. The beach is separated from the rest of the property by a 60-foot cliff. My family and I, including my dog, were enjoying a week of our summer at the cabin and were walking along the beach, which is private, when we spotted something near a rocky bulkhead on a neighboring property. As we drew closer, we saw the carcass of a white-tailed deer splayed out on a flat rock that was around eight feet by six feet. The head and left back leg of the deer remained, but the other three legs and the rest of the body were gone. The animal showed no signs of being in the water and did not emit much of an odor either that a deer carcass left in the sun usually would. As the family gathered around, some of the younger kids moved close to the carcass and attempted to touch it. I immediately warned them against doing so, saying that a decomposing carcass has bacteria on it that could make them sick. Thankfully, they listened. Honestly, though, I felt that whatever had killed this thing and dismembered it was either going to return to claim the remaining carcass that day or was watching us from a distance, waiting. We left it well enough alone and headed back to the cabin. That night after dinner and everyone heading to bed, I stayed up and had a couple glasses of wine, watching a movie. I eventually fell asleep in my chair, only to be awakened by my dog howling at around 3 a.m., my dog has very sensitive hearing and usually was only set off by two sounds, the buzzing of our fridge at home or the wail of the siren of an emergency vehicle. She can usually be consoled and always seems more annoyed than afraid. This time, it was different. Her howling sounded pained and scared, almost wavering. When I found her, she was underneath an old armchair in the living room of the cabin, trembling. Once I was able to calm her down to the point where she was merely whimpering, I heard what was frightening her. It was a definite call that pierced the silence and sounded a lot like a howler monkey, but from something much, much larger. It was coming from the forest that separated the cabin from the road and could have been closer to the road. I've stayed in this area four to five times a year for the last four decades, and I'm well acquainted with the sounds of the local fauna. From the sounds of the aforementioned white-tailed deer to the insane range of sounds that Red Fox can make, I've heard them all, but I've never heard anything like that. It sounded like a primate, and it sounded huge. Now I refer to the sound as a call, because something responded to it, something on the other side of the cabin, and it sounded like it was only 200 yards away. It was the same type of call, the same type of creature. And then a third response echoed back to the other two from farther away in and around where the beach was. I could hear the three of them, whatever the heck they were, move southwards from our property to the next, eventually trailing off completely, 
Shockingly, no one else in the cabin was awakened by it. I sat with my dog doing my best to keep her calm, staying with her until she fell asleep. I'm fully convinced that what I heard that night was a group of three Sasquatch. Luckily, they only seemed to be passing through. The Creature on the Dark Road from Merritt It was a late evening on a hot summer day around 1 a.m. I was on my way home from a bar after we went to the fun fair together. I went by bicycle, and unfortunately, none of my friends were going in the same direction as me that night, so I'd be going alone. I tried going the long way, but the road was closed, and I couldn't get past it, not even on foot, so I had to go the long way. It was a winding road where I had to cross a point from where there were no lights, just woods. I tried biking as fast as I could, but midway my bicycle lights began to flicker out and the air grew very cold. I felt a little spooked, honestly, but I shook it off as I thought it was just a breeze, even though upon leaving it was still 98 degrees out. I started biking faster because I knew my light was not going to make it. With all the light I had left, I stopped long enough to get some new batteries out of my bag and put the new ones in. I thought I was good to go, but about an hour later, my lights were shutting off again. I was now in the dark at 1 a.m., in the middle of nowhere, with no homes near me for at least a mile. I started walking with my bicycle in my hands, being careful about every step. At this time, cell phones had no flashlights on them, and my phone was not charged, and died before leaving the bar. I was now sweating, feeling watched from all around me. Suddenly, the forest went silent. I took a quick look over my shoulder, and what I saw next made my heart jump from my chest. Two big yellow eyes were right behind me, but when I blinked, they were gone. I told myself, I'm just seeing things, relax, it's just my imagination. The moment I said that in my mind, a loud, piercing scream came from one side of the woods. I was now panicking because that scream did not sound human. It didn't even sound like it came from a normal animal. I had goosebumps all over and I was having trouble breathing. I was running with my bicycle in my hand straight ahead, scared because I couldn't see the thing that was following me. Then all of a sudden, there was a light coming from behind me and I thought it was a car. But when it came closer, I saw that it was a woman in a long white and red dress with dark long hair, black eyes, and a mouth that was agape and open, screaming right at me. At that moment, I lost it. I jumped on my bicycle and started pedaling away. I didn't care if I hit something. I just wanted to leave this place. I kept going and going even after I couldn't see her anymore. When I saw lights in the distance, I rode straight for them and I was soon standing near a busy road. I started following that road on my bike, scared to death. After three more long hours, I finally made it home. What did I see? Who was that woman screaming at me? I pray I never experience anything like that again. Woman in the Woods, from X Originals X, this took place in the woods near where I live in England. It was back in November of 2017. I enjoyed going out on late night walks with my brother or friends. I liked going out into the woods because it helped me reconnect with myself and nature. Usually me and whoever I take with me just go and sit on some logs. I was with some friends of mine. We had just gone out for a walk and we wanted to go past where we usually stay at. As we got deeper into the woods, we got bored, so we started to listen to music out loud. Out of nowhere, after the third song, we suddenly heard a woman's voice asking if anyone was out there. At first, we ignored her, but she asked again, so one of my friends responded, Yes, are you okay? The voice replied, No, and then there was dead silence. 
We didn't know which direction her voice was coming from. We then turned around and started to walk back when I felt like someone was watching us. So I messaged the group to ask them if they feel the same way, and they did. Our pace began to pick up, but we soon heard the voice once more. She asked, why are you children alone? Casually but cautiously, we replied, saying that we were just out for a walk. We soon saw the woman though. She was just standing there in the woods. She was tall, slim, and had pale skin. Her hair was dark brown, but what was disturbing was that her eyes were red and there was blood dripping from her mouth. We asked if she was injured or lost. She didn't reply this time until she looked at my female friends and finally said, this is my home and I think you are lost. She began to walk away and we took the moment to run all the while we heard the woman's laughter in the forest around us. When we exited the woods, we saw the woman again somehow ahead of us. She was sitting on a rock brushing her hair. We didn't want to provoke her, so we stayed our ground. We started to ask more questions like how she was able to get here before us and why she was following us. Instead of a normal response, she made this weird throaty noise like she was trying to clear a dry throat. Then she dropped something from her hand. When I reached for it, she grabbed it first and ran away. I still go into those woods to see if I can see her again, as I've got so many questions for her. I even hear her voice sometimes at night near the woods, asking if anyone is out there. Ah, the woods are great. Don't be scared. So long as you're in the comfort of your own home, you'll be all right. Just sit back and relax to the sounds of other people encountering horrors in the forest and pray that those horrors don't encroach on your home. Good night. If you enjoyed this episode of Darkness Prevails, be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe. If you want your story told, share it with us at darkstories.org. If you want to support the show, Check the links in the description. There's a link to my Patreon where you can donate and a link to my merch store where you can get some awesome creepy merchandise. Now then, as usual, here are my five favorite early comments from the previous episode about five hunting horror stories. Gato Dogcat says, now this is what I'm talking about. So you've been talking about sexy hunters meeting sexy demises in the sexy woods? Very nice, Gato, very nice. GB Tech 89 says, Hey Darkness, wanna go Wendigo hunting at night? Eh, why not? I've got a death wish anyway. Jade Lily 510 Luna says, Sometimes I wish I had a story to submit, but then I realize I shouldn't, because do I really want to have any sort of terrifying experience? Yeah, there's basically two groups of people here. Folks who want to hear creepy things but not experience them, and those like me who really do for some stupid reason. I used to daydream thinking about how cool it would be if the Silent Hill world suddenly appeared around me, even though it would mean my certain doom. Yeeter Yang says, this is how many times I've been scared. Eh, I like this. It's a pretty on the nose way of getting upvotes, but at least it's a bit creative. And Eric with the K says, darkness, let's go dogman hunting. You mean go adopt a good boy that stands on two legs? Heck yeah. Well, that brings us to the end of this Darkness Prevails episode, but don't you worry, because more scary stories are coming soon, so stay tuned. Until next time, here are the credits to my amazing patrons who continue to donate. They're great people. Remember, stay safe out there and stay creepy, because this world is a strange one. <laughs>